Good evening, everyone. I'm Sherry Gleed. I'm the Dean of NYU Wagner's Graduate School of Public Service. And on behalf of Wagner, it's my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome you to tonight's debate. Two years ago, actually, NYU Wagner and the Century Foundation teamed up and combined the resources and talents of our organizations to create a public debate series showcasing thoughtful, informed dialogue from diverse experts on a range of vital national policy issues. Since then, we've held seven thought-provoking debates on higher education, immigration, national security, intervention in Syria, policing, school vouchers, and gentrification. We are thrilled to be continuing this series this year, and even more so to hold our first debate here in our nation's capital, NYU, uh, Washington, D.C., and at NYU, D.C. Um, this facility, our host for this, the evening, is one of the university's global campus sites. It's a place where NYU students can immerse themselves in Washington's engaging intellectual, cultural, and political environment. Thank you to our friends at NYU DC for hosting us in this lovely space. We at NYU Wagner have a long history in public service here in DC, back home in New York City, and in cities around the globe. For over 75 years, we've been helping our students translate their passion into action so they can make an effective and lasting impact on the public good. Our students and alumni all over the world apply their education to make a real impact on people's lives through healthcare, international development, urban planning, nonprofit management, finance, social innovation, and many other fields. Part of making a real impact is understanding all perspectives on a problem, and conversations such as tonight's are vital to helping us think through the big issues in public service today. These debates are an opportunity for thought leaders, practitioners, students, researchers, decision makers, and any interested citizen to hear varied perspectives on relevant and timely issues. Today's discussion will focus on school segregation and how we prioritize the challenges of equity and opportunity in education policy. We are pleased to welcome our debaters as they delve deeper into this important and challenging subject. While we may not all agree on the right outcome, I think we can safely say that continuing a dialogue such as this and listening to what both sides have to say will help us gain a greater understanding and hopefully new perspectives, both of which are hallmarks of good citizenship and of creating sound policies. I want to offer a warm welcome to Secretary John King, Cheryl Cashin, and Dr. Howard Fuller. They will receive proper introductions shortly, but on behalf of NYU Wagner and the Century Foundation, we thank you for, bringing, for being a part of this debate and sharing your insights. We are live streaming tonight's debate, so I want to welcome those of you who are joining us online. We're glad you're taking part virtually. When we first began discussing this series of debates with the Century Foundation, we all agreed that a vital part of the program would be involving our audience. And there are two ways you can take part in tonight's conversation and ask questions. Number one is Twitter. And number two is old-fashioned index cards. For Twitter, you can submit a question using the hashtag D-O-T-C which you will see in your programs and on the screen. Uh, the second way to ask a question is by writing it down on an index card. Simply raise your hand at any time during the debate, and an usher will pick it up from you. They also have extra index cards if you didn't pick up any at check-in. So before we start, we want to take your pulse about tonight's topic. We're going to conduct a poll right now, and then again, we'll conduct one after the debate is over to see if anybody's opinions have shifted. You can join the poll in one of two ways. You can join via text. Simply text D-O-T-C to 37607. You can also join from any web browser. Go to polleve.com slash D-O-T-C and follow the prompts. There is no need to register or log in. I'll give you all a second now to join the poll through text or your browser. Instructions are on the screen behind me. OK. Is everybody ready? Have you joined the poll? Let's poll. Tonight's resolution is, one of the biggest threats to education today is school segregation. Do you agree or disagree with this statement? After you've joined the poll, simply text yes, no, or undecided. Now, let's see the results. Let's wait a minute. It usually takes a minute until we get enough up there. Yes. Yeah, the yes is the yeas are winning at this point. Winning even more. All right. Um, we'll let you keep polling. We're going to take another poll after the debate to see if anyone's 
uh, opinions have changed, if the experts were able to uh, sway opinions. It's now my pleasure to turn the stage over to our partner in this endeavor, the Century Foundation. Please welcome senior fellow Denise Ford. Good evening, everybody. And on behalf of the Century Foundation, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the eighth debate of the century. First, I want to say a, thame, a warm thank you to the teams at the Century Foundation and NYU Wagner for the time and effort that they've put in to organizing tonight's event, a task made all the more challenging because tonight is the first debate in the series to be held in our nation's capital. A special thanks to the incredible dean of NYU Wagner, Sherry Gleed. Your policy, leadership, and good humor are truly unmatched. I want to also acknowledge some other guests in the room. Century Foundation President Mark Zuckerman is here with us tonight, as is TCF trustee and Maya Angelou, pres uh, presidential chair at Wake Forest University, Melissa Harris Perry. We are so thrilled that Melissa is here with us tonight and has brought with her several <coughs> students from the Black on Campus National Student Journalism Program. Thank you for joining us here tonight and for the work you are doing, Melissa, to raise the quality of discourse and the need for more diverse voices in, in journalism. I also want to mention my colleague, TF, TCF Senior Fellow Richard Kallenberg, who for two decades now has led the research and policy work on school desegregation as an essential means of reducing educational inequality. And of course, we have to thank our esteemed debaters and moderator, who you will meet in just a few moments. But before we get to that, I want to tell you just a little bit about the Century Foundation. We are one of the oldest public policy think tanks in the country, established in 1919 by Edward Filene, headquartered in New York City with a growing office here in DC. Our experts are leading thinkers and change makers, working on everything from educational equity to jobs and the economy, privacy and civil liberties, health care, and foreign policy. But now let us turn to tonight's topic. 64 years ago, our country found itself in a crossroads in education. Do we choose to embrace our diversity and ensure its presence in our schools, economy, and democracy, make the proper investments, and bring about change to ensure equity of opportunity, or do we turn away? What exactly would be our responsibility? Well, the courts and Brown v. Board of Education provided one answer. The decision said, today, education is perhaps the most important function of state and local governments. And to go on, it is required in the performance of our most basic public responsibilities, even service in the armed services. It is the very foundation of good citizenship. Today, it is a principal instrument in awakening the child to cultural values, in preparing him for later professional training, and in helping him to adjust normally to his environment. In these days, it is doubtful that any child may reasonably be expected to succeed in life if he is denied the opportunity of an education. And such an opportunity, where the state has undertaken to provide it, is a right which must be available to all on equal terms. So the court did provide an answer but not necessarily guidance on how to achieve this goal. How do you make education available to all on equal terms? Without this guidance, many of us have seen opportunity missed and squandered. We have data, federal data from GAO that tells us racial, from 2001 to 2013, 14, racial and socioeconomic isolation in K-12 public schools grew from nine to 16%. 61% of all high poverty schools are populated by at least 75% students of color. Hispanic students tend to be triple segregated by race, economics, and language. But that's not to say that we don't have some pockets of success, magnet schools and charter schools and some public schools who are focused intentionally on diversity and equity in their mission, that they are not widespread and more children tend to be left out of the opportunity that we know is possible for poor children, children of color, and different abilities in language. So this evening, we will have the opportunity for a spirited debate on the issue of school segregation. And I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our moderator for the evening. 
My friends, it is an immense pleasure for me to introduce John King, President and CEO of the Education Trust and the former Secretary of Education for President Obama. As the President and CEO, John is bringing his personal and professional experience to an organization that is leading the fight to close achievement gaps for our young people and truly bring equity into the classroom. This has been his fight for a long time, starting as a high school teacher, bringing the light of day to history not told in his classrooms, to being a school leader as the head of Uncommon Schools, to his role as the first African American and Puerto Rican State Education Commissioner for New York, and of course his most recent role, Educator in Chief, the Secretary of Education, where he himself championed racial and social economic diversity and put money behind it in the first ever federal grants to support achieving diversity in the classroom. King's life story is an extraordinary testament to the transformative power of education. Both of his parents were career New York City public school educators whose example serves as an enduring inspiration. He credits New York City public school teachers, particularly educators at PS 276 and Mark Twain Junior High School in Coney Island for saving his life by providing him with rich and engaging educational experiences. Uh, it is indeed my pleasure to welcome John King to the stage and thank you for being our moderator. Thank you so much, Denise, and thank you to the Century Foundation and to NYU for this opportunity to have an important conversation about the future of education. A, a few words of context for tonight's discussion. It's worth noting that today's young people are growing up in an America that is more diverse than ever before. They grow up in an America where a majority of the students in our public schools are students of color. Majority of the students in our public schools are eligible for free or reduced price lunch. About 10% of the kids in our public schools are English learners. And yet, more than 60 years after Brown versus Board of Education, schools in many parts of the country are as segregated as they have ever been, and in many parts of the country, significantly more segregated than they were 10 or 20 years ago. Consider that here in Washington, DC, there is a public school with 11% low-income students, less than a mile away from a school where 99% of the students are low-income. Consider as well the recent report from the US Commission on Civil Rights that noted that approximately 77% of Latino students and 73% of African American students attend schools that are majority students of color, and approximately 88% of white students attend schools that are at least half white. Those differences in school enrollment exist alongside significant gaps in outcomes. Consider that whether you look at the National Assessment of Educational Progress or state tests or ACT or SAT, you see glaring persistent achievement gaps for students of color and low income students. You see those same gaps in high school graduation despite the progress we've made as a country in recent years. And you see those same gaps in college graduation where of every 10 African American students who start college only four will have graduated six years later. For Latino students, just five. And for white students, six. So that's the backdrop for tonight's conversation. Uh, the format will be that we will have our two speakers come out. They will offer opening remarks. There will then be rebuttals. We'll then have a, a conversation, the three of us. Then we'll turn to the audience for questions. And then we will uh, have closing arguments and revisit the poll that you took. So on to our speakers. Let me first introduce Cheryl Cashin. Cheryl Cashin is the Waterhouse Professor of Law, Civil Rights, and Social Justice at the Georgetown University Law Center. She teaches administrative law, race and American law, and a writing seminar on American segregation, education, and opportunity. She's written extensively on issues of civil rights and race relations, including a book, The Failures of Integration, which explored the persistence and consequences of race and class segregation. 
She worked at the Clinton White House as an advisor on urban and economic policy. And her academic background is quite impressive, having graduated from Vanderbilt, Oxford, Harvard Law School, and having clerked for Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. Please join me in welcoming Cheryl Cash. Mm -hmm. And now, the equally impressive, uh, even-handed, equally impressive uh, <laughs> Howard Fuller. Uh, Dr. Fuller is the Distinguished Professor of Education and founder and director of the Institute for the Transformation of Learning at Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The mission of the Institute is to support exemplary education options that transform learning for children while empowering families, particularly low-income families, to choose the best options for their children. Immediately before his appointment at Marquette, Dr. Fuller served as the superintendent of Milwaukee Public Schools from 1991 to 1995. He has received numerous awards and recognitions, too many to count. Um, he also is the longtime board chair of the Black Alliance for Educational Options and is a member of the advisory board of the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools. His memoir, No Struggle, No Progress, was published in 2014. Um, also a very impressive academic background, a, uh, having earned a degree in sociology at Carroll College, an MSA degree in social administration from Western Reserve University in Ohio, and a PhD in sociological foundations of education from Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. All right, so with those introductions out of the way, <laughs> we will now turn to Professor Cashin. Thank you so much, it's an honor to be here. The grievous harm to children trapped in high poverty, low resource schools, is a point I will get to, and it's what um, has animated my whole academic career in writing about these issues. But tonight, I prefer to lead with the less obvious argument about the need to abolish school segregation in order to repair a broken nation. At bottom, segregation ensures that most Americans, particularly whites with choices, are never forced to practice the kind of robust pluralism that is necessary to humanize poor black and brown children. To summarize my first claim, segregation is a vestige of white supremacy. It must be abolished if we are to reconstruct a nation not built on the foundation of supremacy. The idea that a dominant whiteness should be protected and insulated, particularly from a blackness that many people have been taught to fear. Deeply segregated pockets of black poverty are a modern manifestation of this persistent, ugly ideology. My second argument for abolishing segregation is that it is necessary for achieving the values, if not the latter, of the Equal Protection Clause enshrined in the 14th Amendment. This value of equality, won through the blood of civil war and that, and that of generations of civil rights soldiers was added to the Constitution to overturn Dred Scott, uh, to make newly freed bondsmen citizens. Equality as a constitutional and social value, if we really mean what, what we say, if we really mean we stand for that, requires integration and inclusion. Segregation is deeply in implicated in undermining equality. Um, Mr. Secretary um, uh, gave you an overview um, of the stats. Uh, the majority of black and Latino kids uh, attend majority minority schools and most whites attend majority very white schools, but another dimension of segregation is that exposure to poverty is typical for black and Latino school children and much less common uh, for white and Asian kids. Uh, the average black or Latino 
child in public education to get today is in a school where two-thirds of his or her peers are poor. Racially segregated high poverty schools often have less experienced and less qualified teachers, high levels of teacher turnover, less successful peer groups, and inadequate facilities and learning materials, all of which limit educational outcomes. The logic of Brown v. Board of Education was right. Separate is inherently unequal in a winner-take-all society that hoards opportunity in certain places and disinvests elsewhere. This segues to my third um, main argument for abolishing segregation, and I use the word abolition. I choose that word intentionally. Abolition of segregation is necessary to improve possibilities for a better, saner politics. Segregation makes it easier to sell racial dogma about outgroups. Studies show that people who lead integrated lives, who attend integrated schools, tend to exhibit less prejudice. And there is you know, recent research by political scientists in this country that shows that segregation into your own neighborhoods and schools is producing, I'm um, sad to deliver this, um, racist worldviews and where people tend to vote, um, vote those uh, racist sensibilities. We cannot repair what is broken in this country. We cannot restore the social contract without restoring context for, for practicing pluralism. Um, we also you know, need uh, places where people can get a common civic education, a common understanding of our collective history, a common understanding of facts and science. Those are my three opening positions. I'm ready for the debate. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Fuller. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay, so I was asked to address this question. One of the biggest threats to education today is school segregation. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So number one, and, and, and these three things are very important for you all to understand from the onset. Number one, I do not now, nor have I ever, supported state-sponsored or state-supported subordination of black people and other non-white people in this country. Racial separation or segregation is only one manifestation of that subordination. I have always and always will oppose the use of legal and quasi-legal methods to separate people of different races as a way to reinforce the tenets of white supremacy in this country. The tenets have as their foundation the belief in the inferiority of black people and other non-white people. Secondly, my concerns about this topic are focused on the realities that are faced by low-income and working-class black people in this country. I am concerned about the people that Dr. Howard Thurman referred to as the disinherited. Those of my people who, quote, live with their backs constantly against the wall, the poor, the disinherited, and the dispossessed. Number three, I actually believe that pursuing strategies of racial integration or class integration in schools can be one of the strategies we employ as we fight for the educational needs and interests of the students that I cited above. With these qualifications in mind, I stand today, tonight, to say to you that for the families of the disinherited, the biggest immediate threat to their education is not segregation. It is the lack of interest and commitment to their overall well-being, including education, by the body politic writ large in this country. I am suggesting that policies and circumstances which limit their families, one, access to health care, decent housing, well-paying jobs, 
or place certain people under the threat of being deported at any moment. That is these things that pose a greater threat to their educational lives than, quote, segregated schools. I would also add that the, ex uh, the, the, the essential threat is the philosophical foundation of many who argue for focusing our attention only on the integration of schools. That foundation is best described by Derrick Bell, either implicitly or explicitly, when they assert that the actual presence of white children is said to be essential, that black somehow must gain access to white schools because, quote, equal educational opportunity means integrated schools, and because only school integration will make certain that black children will receive the same education as white children. This theory of school desegregation, however, fails to encompass the complexity of achieving equal educational opportunity for children to whom it has long been denied. Therefore, my stance on the question before us is captured by the words of Judge Robert Carter. And I assume you all know that Judge Robert Carter was the attorney who had the responsibility to put the social science literature before Brown, the literature that is contained in footnote 11 of the Brown decision that most people who talk about it ain't never read. And so that if you look at what he said, and he was clear, he said that integrated education must not be lost as the ultimate solution. That would be a disaster in my judgment. For the present, however, to focus on integration alone is a luxury that only the black middle class can afford. They have the means to desert the public schools if they're dissatisfied. They could obtain remediation if necessary and get their children into college or some income producing enterprise. The urgent need for the black urban poor is the attainment in real life terms and in settings that will be virtually all black, at least some of the benefits and equal protections that were guaranteed by Brown. The only way to ensure that thousands of black urban poor children will have even a remote chance of obtaining the tools that are needed for them to have a decent chance when they come into the marketplace in America is to figure out how to make sure that they receive a quality education in those schools where it is only black children attending and are likely to be attending for at least another generation. Thank you. Professor Cashin, a, a rebuttal. So um, I'm sympathetic to a number of things that Howard has said so passionately, but I, I've let the record reflect that my twin boys are in a public charter school, not a private school, um, where a quarter of the kids are on free and reduced lunch. Um, so I haven't, you know, left the scene, right? I'm, I'm, I'm fighting the good fight. Well, let me say this. Um, segregation is one of the things that really harms all children. Sociologist James Coleman first reported in 1966 what common sense tells us. Um, the primary predictor of school performance is the socioeconomic background of the children. Coleman concluded that social composition of the student body was more highly related to ch a child's achievement than any other factor including per-pupil expenditure, class size, teacher experience. And this groundbreaking insight has been confirmed by decades of subsequent research. This does not mean that poor kids are stupid, but policies that concentrate poverty are stupid. Uh, meanwhile, integration has been shown to produce ample educational, social, and economic benefits for disadvantaged and advantaged people who experience it, including reducing racism. Um, different policy choices produce better outcomes. Um, I like to cite the example of Montgomery County, Maryland, where Mr. Secretary lives with his family. Um, in addition to for 
at least four decades promoting inclusionary housing. Uh, this county is also promoting school integration. And I commend to you a uh, study that a lot of education types know very well by Heather Schwartz. In a Century Foundation publication of 2010 entitled Housing Policy is School Policy, they give the results of her study which compared outcomes for black and Latino residents of public housing in the county. Children whose families were allowed to move to middle class neighborhoods and attend middle class schools did much better than children left behind in high poverty schools, even school, though Montgomery County put additional resources into these schools. And this, what I want to underscore is um, that the federal government and local and state government are complicit in creating and encouraging and acquiescing in concentrated black poverty. And I'm arguing that different public policy choices create different and better outcomes, and my concern is not just with the education of black children, but the education of non-black children and what is going on in their minds. Thank you. Thanks. Professor Fulak. Yeah, my, you know, my comment would be mm -hmm. that, um, like what Cheryl said, there are things that she said that I actually agree with. The difference, though, that we have, if, if there is one, is I'm simply saying that Integration can't be the thing that we hang our hats on when it comes to the plight of poor urban children. Because the reality is, and, and, and my comments were not personal to her, but the reality is that a whole lot of y'all who are out here talking about integration, y'all hollering at us living in some of these enclaves that you have put together so y'all can be out there with white people or at least with people who all have the same class foundation. And so my argument is simply that while some of y'all are pursuing integration, and I say God speed to you, that when it comes to the question of what is the biggest threat to urban children today, it's not segregated schools. It is the reality that we're not committed to making sure that they get a quality education. And there are studies out there that show, and there was just an article recently about these same Montgomery County that y'all are talking about, where you got people with different incomes, and the gap between the white people who got money and black kids who presumably also have some money is still white. How do you explain that when you have an integrated circumstances, but yet the gap remains? And all I'm trying to suggest tonight is that if we're going to seriously talk about what's going to happen to poor black children, then we've got to be able to admit that in the near future, they're not going to be in integrated circumstances. And at some point in time, no matter what you think about integration, we got to figure out how do we ensure that these kids get a great education? Because if we don't figure that out, how is it that you think that they're going to have any chance in America. But I, I, again, I want to be clear. I do not support the notion of using racial separation as a way to subordinate people. I don't support the people in this country, including the dude who is at the top of this country, who is clearly a white supremacist and is pushing white supremacist notion. I ain't with that. But at the same time, I'm trying to deal with the reality of what's happening to my children on a day-to-day -day basis in these communities that many people who are talking to me about integration left for the precise reason that they didn't want to go to school with these children. All right. Thank you both. Can we have a round of applause? Um, all right, so turning to some questions. Uh, Professor Fuller, I, I want to raise an argument that Nicole Hannah-Jones, the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, writer for the New York Times, would raise. She would say the reason she is concerned about integration is not that she thinks African-American kids will learn better because they're sitting next to white kids, but precisely because she agrees with your concern that resources follow 
white middle class kids. And her argument would be that the reality of American politics is that in the absence of integration, the resources will not come. Right. And that integration is the lever by which we ensure resource equity. Right. You know, I, I've never met her. I've read her stuff, and I appreciate all that. What I'm saying, John, is like, like right now in Milwaukee, man, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 68% of the kids in the Milwaukee public school system are black. There's only 14% of the kids in the district that are white. Talk about integration, man. It's like a moot issue. And there's no, there's no political will in this country to create these metro districts and all of these things to bring black kids into at least hollering distance to, uh, with white people. Because the, the reality of it is white people and, 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 and people with money have spoken by, by, by moving so that they don't have to deal with stuff that they're explaining to us why it's important to do. So you're never going to put me in a position where I'm going to argue that I want my children to be in a position where they don't get what they deserve as, 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 as human beings and as citizens of this country. But what I'm trying to argue, John, is that for me, at least at this moment in time, the ability to create the kind of integrated society that you all are talking about and that ultimately I actually agree with I just don't see how that happens. And so all I'm saying to you is, fine, y'all work on that. While y'all working on that, I'm going to be down here trying to figure out how do I make sure that the kids in my school get the best education possible. That's the only argument that I'm making. Professor Cashin, how would you respond to, to the argument that there just isn't the political will? And this question is beside the point. You know, it's really interesting, the same Con political constraints on creating integrated schools also create political constraints on investing in other people's children. The white folks in the suburbs that you're talking about, um, Howard, and, and you, I admit you are in a really tough spot because Milwaukee is one of the most segregated metropolitan regions in the country. If not the, when you look at the map of Milwaukee uh, by, based on race, it is shocking, right? It's like a, 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 a clear wall <laughs> around the city. Um, so, but the same, you know, the people who live apart aren't volunteering to pay more taxes for other people's kids. And I'll, I will say, you know, in the, the year I clerked for Justice Marshall, his last active year on the court, we had a lot of conversations about school segregation because we had a case that year. And one of the things he said was very similar to what Nicole Hannah-Jones said. He said, you know, I supported and argued for school integration because I knew that as soon as you have a racially identifiable school, those schools are going to be the first one to be cut in terms of resources in the context of scarcity. Um, and so, you know, I drank the Kool-Aid um, and, and am a passionate advocate for integration um, because I don't, I, don't, I don't see how we, you know, I don't see any shortcuts to the third reconstruction, right? Um, yes, we do need to create coalitions of what I call culturally dexterous whites, people who give a damn about somebody other than their own children culturally dexterous whites and people of color to fight together for more equity, for more investment, but also for integrated schools. I don't think these movements are mutually exclusive. And I'll say, lawsuits help. Lawsuits help. If you look at the um, chef movement and the chef case and the 45 magnet schools that got built up around that, um, they didn't go begging uh, people who moved out of Hartford and away from Hartford to do more, they forced them to do more with a lawsuit um, based on the state constitution. But a movement, they call themselves the chef movement, of urban and suburban and people of all colors has grown up around. And some people are returning to the public square of education because uh, of this movement. And how would you respond, Professor Cash, to the argument that some might make that 
The reality is in many schools, even if they're integrated at the door, the opportunities available to kids within the school are quite different. You'll find the AP classes have almost all white students, the remedial classes almost all African American students. You'll find disparate discipline. For example, we know African American kids make up 18% of the kids in pre-K, but 48% of the kids who are suspended from pre-K. Mm -hmm. What would you say to folks who say, actually, maybe kids would be safer and better supported in schools that weren't integrated? Well, in, in racially identifiable high poverty schools, you see a lot of the same um, punitive approach to kids, too. You've heard of the SROs, you know, putting security officers in these high poverty uh, black schools, um, same kind of behavior, prison to pipeline. Um, there's uh, a different kind of relationship to students in middle class schools. So I think there's similar kinds of risks um, in both settings. I don't deny that uh, all of this is difficult, right? Um, integration is difficult. Um, creating cultures that respect all kinds of kids is difficult. But uh, like I said, I don't think you, you just give up because it's difficult. Um, and, and I want to underscore, today, only about 1% of high poverty schools succeed. Only about 1%. Why? Because when you set up a hor direct horizontal competition between affluent places and poor places, experienced teachers are not volunteering to go to very poor places. Um, and what we do, no one says this out loud. No one says out loud, hey, let's overinvest in these high opportunity places and let's disinvest here. Let's give these kids more teachers who aren't certified to teach what they're teaching. Let's have high over, uh, uh, turnover. You know, no one says that out loud, but that's exactly what happens in this direct competition. The one thing that I have read, and you would know more about this than me, a lot more about this than me, the one thing that seems to work in concentrated poverty settings is very reduced class sizes. You know, really, really small ratios between teaching adults and children and excellent teachers, right? But that's requiring more money, not equal funding, but more money to go to impoverished settings. And our current politics does the opposite. All our comp competitors in the OECD do, do, do that. They put more resources into disadvantaged settings. We do the opposite here. We overinvest in advantage settings. So um, neither is working for black kids. Mm. <laughs> I, I'm like lost, man. Mm. Because, I mean, the question that you all asked was, what is the biggest threat <laughs> to education? And, and the argument was the segregation. I've tried to make an argument that no, while that is certainly one of the threats, it is not the biggest threat. And as I listen to Cheryl, she's making my argument because essentially she's talking about the class realities. Because when you say, for example, you know, what happens in poor schools, there's a lot of poor white people out here. So it's not ultimately a discussion about race. It then ultimately becomes a discussion about class. And because of the, 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 the way that class operates in America, because a disproportionate number of people who are poor are people of color, we end up talking about racial solutions to something that is fundamentally a class problem. But, but, but having said that, you're talking to someone who, when I was arrested for the first time, it was in Cleveland, Ohio, I was arrested because I was sitting in on the school board trying to prevent them from building Glenville. Glenview High School that now exists because we thought it was going to be all black. And I got arrested saying, hey, man, y'all shouldn't be building a school in the black community. Now I would be arrested if you tried to come in and take the school. So that the, 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 the and I, just, just so everybody knows when you start talking about personal stuff, I integrated a college by myself. And I would never tell anybody to do that because of the impact of that uh, on me as like a human being. So, so having said all of that, Cheryl and John, I, I'm simply trying to make the argument that 
we must understand that tomorrow, next week, next year, the year after that, no matter how relentless you are pursue integration, we have learned that white people who don't want it are going to relentlessly fight it, that people with resources are going to find all kinds of new ways not to do it, and 50 years later, somebody's going to be in a room arguing the same point because the reality is, as Derrick Bell said, racism is not a small part of America. It is a part of the American fabric. And so that when, if that is true, and I believe that it is, I'm trying to argue we have to have multiple strategies to fight to try to make sure that our kids get educated. Integration needs to be one of those, but it cannot be the focus of what we do in the world of 2018. So let me press you on the, the range of strategies, because right. essentially Professor Cashin is arguing, look, if you're in this situation of concentrated poverty, right. go to court and challenge. Right the district lines, right. right? Do what happened in Chef in Connecticut, right. challenge whether or not the state is fulfilling its constitutional responsibility. If not that, then what? But John, I'm, see, I'm not arguing about y'all going to court, man. Anybody want to go to court, go to court. Go, go wherever y'all can go. I'm simply making a point. While y'all in court over the next 20 years, <laughs> we got to make sure that poor black children who are waiting for the court decision and will have children of their own by the time you get a court decision, that we have figured out a way to give them the best education possible. We need to fight for resources for them. For example, I am not, I, I'm, I'm a supporter of vouchers and all that, but I don't support taking money to, to create a voucher and taking it out of Title I funds or funds that are, that are there for poor children who already don't have enough funds. So if, if someone wants to line up tomorrow to fight for more funds for disadvantaged kids, I'm in that line. I'm on that picket line. Because I believe that everything that we can do to bring resources to those children, we should do. And for those of you who believe that integration is critical, I, I, I applaud you for, 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 for fighting. And you will never find me out there arguing about you all shouldn't do that. My argument is simply that if you just simply pursue that, it's not real in terms of the day-to-day -day reality of the children that I'm talking about. So what, but let me press further. So in that, in a city of concentrated poverty, right. Professor Cashin goes to court on behalf yeah. of the community. Yeah. In the meantime, mm -hmm. Your message to the community is to do what instead? John, here's the thing, man. You, you know that there's certain things you can do to ensure that kids get a great education, e e even under circumstances that are horrible, right? The question is, do we have a clear mission? The question is, do we create an environment where kids have a sense of belonging? Do we create an environment where kids have a sense of autonomy? Do we create an environment where kids are taught to read, write, think, analyze, and compute? I would argue that as hard as it is, you can create those environments in places that are all black and all poor. And I would argue that it is being done every single day in this country. And that my argument is that those of you who say it can't be done, you should say you're not doing it because there is somebody in America who is doing it every single day. Now, am I going to stand up and say, oh, this is great, though. We have so few resources. No, I'm going to be at court with y'all fighting for the resources. But then when we get done with the court that day, I'm going back and keep trying to create these environments of the kind that I just described that will give poor kids the best chance to get a quality education. May I respond? Yes. Um, so. I reject the, the argument that I'm talking about class. I, I am talking about race, and here's why. Um, if you are white and poor, statistically, you are more likely to be in a middle class setting, right? If you are black and poor, uh, even black and middle class, e you know, uh, even bl a black person who makes a hundred thousand um, dollars. This is a Ta-Nehisi Coates uh, book. 
Black people making $100,000 tend to live in neighborhoods um, with the kind of amenities or accoutrements that white people making $30,000 do. But forget about affluent black people. Um, poor black people are overwhelmingly exposed to concentrated poverty. It is, a, and it is a racial dimension. The iconic dark ghetto that Ken, Kenneth uh, Clark talked about was an intentional, an intentional, you can read Richard Rothstein's book, an intentional peculiar American institution that was ba based on, and continues to be based on, anti-black empathy, uh, anti-black hostility and anti-black fear, right? And so it, it, it is racialized. Now, the other thing I want to respond to is it, it, you, you can say that people every day are creating excellence in the, con in the context of concentrated black poverty. I submit to you that there's not a lot of research bearing that out. Yes, you might be able to find the Harlem's Children's Zone. Yes, you may be able to find some examples, KIPP schools. A lot of those places, KIPP in particular, um, they, push out, they push out people. Um, it's not happening systemically. And the, you know, a lot of the public charter schools, despite my kids being in one, are more segregated than the regular system, but uh, segregation into highly poor, racially identifiable black schools is a recipe for disaster. Meanwhile, um, there are some places that are doing things differently. Um, and, and we have a chicken and egg problem, right? Um, the fear of black people in numbers and the avoidance of black people and the lack of habits of dealing with black people, the demonization of black people contributes to the blaming of the victim, the unwillingness of state legislatures to invest in urban schools. So we have a chicken and egg problem. Like I said, there's no shortcut to the third reconstruction. If we don't begin to build more context where people experience people who are different and get practice at that, and frankly, there's a lot of demand for that among younger people, right? Younger people, millennials, are much less afraid of black people than their parents and their grandparents. Um, you're shaking your head, but I got to tell you, 60% of white millennials agree with the Black Lives Matter movement's critique of law, uh, critique of law enforcement. They agree with it. There are potential allies out there. I'm in a city um, where a lot of whites who cannot afford to buy their way into a premium neighborhood want to be in these schools. Um, you know, the DC has a very mature charter movement that's based not on high stakes testing or, um, you know, you can get access to quality decoupled from the neighborhood where you live, and people are returning to the public square. So it is possible today to build your small utopia while you're trying to, to fight for the bigger things. It is possible to build some examples. I submit, even in a Milwaukee, you know, where you might have some um, magnet schools that draw kids from different places where people can see a context where robust multiracial pluralism works so that they're not so freaking, I almost said a bad word, afraid, <laughs> afraid of diversity. There's no shortage for putting up these examples um, to get people to return to public schools and invest with them and, and, and support them. Yeah, I would, mm -hmm. I would say a couple of things. Number one, mm -hmm. I want to see where all these millennials are when they have kids. Mm -hmm. and, and then they got to start making real decisions instead of theoretical decisions made at Yale in a discussion about integration. The second thing that I would say is that you, you, you made an argument that you're not talking about class, and then you start talking about class. I, wait, let me finish. Because the point I'm trying to make is, and I was very clear, I said that it is both a racial issue and a class issue. And I also said very clearly that because of the way that class operates in this country and the way that race operates, and the fact that a disproportionate number of people who are poor are also people of color, 
that we will at times come up with a racial solution for something that is fundamentally a class problem. And it doesn't work because the fundamentals are not just race, they're class. It's the nature of how class operates in America. And I am not someone who is uninterested in, the, in, in integrating the public square. But I'm interested in trying to make sure that when the integration of the public square takes place, that the black people who enter into the square are able to function in a way that gives them an opportunity to be successful. And I would argue that a part of the problem sometimes, when it comes to even those of you who support integration, y'all like talk so hard about something that is all black, and it is inherently like horrible, and you start, as Chris Stewart said, awfulizing our children, and then white people say, hey man, I'm trying not, not trying to be with them. <laughs> so one of the things we gotta be clear about is in the process of trying to talk about how terrible it is, we don't talk about it in a way that actually presents an opposite effect. Because then what we began to get people to begin, believe is that, it is, that, that, that we're not capable of having excellence in something that is all black or something that is all poor. So there's a danger to how we make these arguments. And, 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 and all I'm trying to say, and I'll say it again, I'll say it again, I'll say it again. I'm not opposed to integration. I think that integration is a good thing in America, but for the vast majority of the children that I care about in the foreseeable future, we're gonna have to figure out how to bring a great education to them in the environments in which they live. And to me, the irony of all of this, the irony of all of this, is that someone locates a charter school, or even a traditional public school, in an area where they never had any decent schools, and then they get browbeaten for supporting segregation. And I just, find, I just find those arguments to be just crazy, man, in terms of the reality that our children are facing today in America. So I go to a virtually all black church. Um, and I grew up in the home of uh, civil rights advocates who really put their lives on the line for dirt poor black sharecroppers in the black belt of Alabama. Um, I think we are equally passionate about black people who the rest of society marginalizes. Um, I, um, I also think that, um, again, we have a chicken and the egg problem because and, and I, I don't think these strategies are mutually exclusive, but when you have to deal with Scott Pruitt and a Wisconsin legislature, I, I don't see, and in the many urban schools, this is what's happening, right? You know, where, where the social contract is just pulling apart, right? You know, um, there's a, 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 ter a new term I heard last year, it came from a debate in Kansas, have you heard this term, government schools? It's a perjurative, you know? Well, this is the place we're at, you know? Many urban school systems, Chicago's dealing with it, Philadelphia's dealing with it, many urban school systems are under the thumb of state legislatures in gerrymandered states with, you know, Republicans who have disproportionate power. And so, you know, it's a challenge to say, okay, we need to give black kids in concentrated poverty schools um, excellence, more resources, when the answer from the legislature is no. Michelle, you know? <laughs> Michelle would you agree that it is equally a challenge to tell these same people we want integration now. Yeah, okay, but here, here's my point. <laughs> so what I'm saying is we, there are models out there. My favorite examples are the chef movement and Montgomery County's inclusionary zoning ordinances and, and their approach. There are models out there, and there are, uh, you're, you're cynical about this, but there is a growing swath, I'm small, 
but it's a growing swath of what I call culturally dexterous white people and, and non-black people that are open to, I, I go to, the, my, I, I participate in a school system, in a, in a school with people like this, that are open to trying something new. And if you look at, you know, you watch some of the videos about the chef movement and listen to the interviews, there are, you know, white suburbanites who are trying, in, in part because exclusion is so expensive. You know, a lot of people cannot afford those premium neighborhoods. They can't afford private school. Um, they want public education, high quality public education to work. And so what I'm saying is we can begin, you know, it took, we, 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 we had 300 centuries of white supremacy in this country. 300, 300, that's, oh, God. Three, at least three centuries of white supremacy in this country and God knows uh, the ideology is still with us, right? Uh, we had structures that were created um, to support it. You know, this is, uh, uh, there's a long arc here, right? But we can pursue some of these structures um, to, as we're also trying to improve politics for equity. That's all I'm saying. So let me turn to mm. the audience questions. And let, let me start with you, Professor Fuller. What about the argument that in the places that have chosen charters or vouchers as a strategy for improvement, they're actually exacerbating segregation? And you said you, you find that claim frustrating. But mathematically, as our questioner asks, if, if, the communities are, if the schools are more segregated once that reform is put in place, isn't that a problem? Well, it's a problem if your focus is on not having schools that are that are black. I'm not see. I don't have the same issue that y'all have. With, I, I have an issue with people not having resources, but I don't. I don't buy into the notion that something is inherently, inherently not equal because it's all black, or or, or, or that by definition you're not able to achieve excellence because it's all black. Y'all can talk to me until tomorrow, and I'm never going to agree with that assertion. So when people say to me, like, well, Howard, aren't you concerned that these schools are now all black? No, I'm concerned that they was all black before and wasn't nobody learning nothing. And so if you now have a situation where you have a school that is all black, but kids are now learning, are now learning at a higher level, I'm good with that. Doesn't mean that I'm, I'm like, oh, OK, I, I, I'm not concerned about integration. I say it over and over again. That, that is never what I'm saying. I, I just keep trying to tell you all that that, to me, is not what the focus ought to be. And it, should, it certainly shouldn't be the only strategy that we pursue. So yeah, I don't. Well, with respect, it's not the only strategy we pursue. We barely pursue it. Mm. Yeah, but you, know, you barely and, and pursue I, integration. I, right. T tell me all the No, I'm saying we barely pursue it. That's what I said. It's right. not the only <laughs> strategy. You see, we barely pursue integration. Um, but I, I'll say, I want to be clear. I am, my argument is not that an, there's something wrong with an all-black school or an all-black institution. Um, what, but what tends to happen is racially identifiable black schools <laughs> Um, almost by definition are impoverished, right? And you say I'm it's, it, it's the intersection of, of both of those things. Um, and frankly, um, I've, I've been very frank all night, right? Um, concentrated black poverty is, is what generates avoidance by um, not just not just, and you've said this, not just whites and other people, upper income uh, black folks, even in a city where Repub Democrats outnumber Republicans by 12 to 1 in this town, you know, even in a city where uh, black people have been in charge of government um, for a while or had been for a while, you know, this, this, this city pursued the war on drugs pursued, you know, uh, a kind of um, punitive policies toward uh, black people who aren't 
respectable in the eyes of, you know. And so that's the problem. And it's not because I, I have a problem with those kids. It's because I'm passionate um, and, and empathetic and an advocate for people who are trapped in high poverty settings without choices. So my point is to put pressure on all levels of government to pursue policies that encourage rather than discourage integration and choices. Now, mm -hmm. Professor Cashin, how would you respond to our questioner who asks, when integration strategies are pursued, isn't the burden often placed on poor folks of color and, I would add, on educators of color? So that is to say that in many places, the integration strategy has resulted in kids of color, low-income kids, riding the bus out someplace else that is not their community. And we know that some of the history around the country around integration was that the immediate implementation resulted in the loss of jobs of African American teachers and principals. How would you respond to that question? Very important question and fair question. I would say that integration as assimilation pursued, particularly um, you know, in the 70s and beyond, it was a poorly, a, 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 a flawed model. Right. What I'm arguing for is, and there may, integration may not be the right word, but a, a 21st century model where white people bear some of the burden of, of acquiring what I call cultural dexterity. And what is cultural dexterity? It's the ability to enter a space where you are outnumbered and feel comfortable. Right. That requires you to acquire some of this skill, right? Um, and these, I think we need to be thinking about creating new institutions with robust norms of inclusion where people of all different walks truly are respected and no one gets to walk into that school and say, you know, this is how it's going to be because my group is in charge, right? Um, and if we don't build institutions where people get practice like this, we're going to have more of the same. More of the same where a demagogue can stoke division, trade in the, the most indecent kind of discourse, and what's the number now? I don't know, 35, 40 percent of the people follow him. Professor. God help us. <laughs> Professor Fuller, what about the impact on civic society of school segregation? You know, I, I really find this a very, very difficult conversation to have because we have gone so far beyond talking about what I thought the question was. <laughs> and that, we, you know, we're pursuing the broad <laughs> construct of American society. And I can get into that discussion as well. But, but, but John, what? Look, I'm trying to make an argument here that in America, the America that I know, racism is fundamental to how it functions and how it operates. And that if black people and our children are going to have any chance of, of success, we're going to have to pursue multiple strategies. And one of those strategies has to be to figure out how do we bring quality in environments that for the foreseeable future are going to be all black and all poor. Now, when it comes to civics, what I find interesting is people who talk about, well, the reason why I support traditional public schools, which I do, by the way, is because it's key to democracy. If you come to Milwaukee and you come to La Follette or you come to schools in the neighborhoods where I live, Ain't no all the races and classes together <laughs> talking about democracy. What, what you have, man, are poor black children who are trying to survive. If you, if you read Evicted, which is about Milwaukee, <laughs> and it's about poor people trying to find housing, and then you, you begin to talk about the realities of their lives, all I'm trying to say to you all is that a discussion that starts focusing in on we, we, we got to have this public square where, where the, the, the good white people and the good black people and the good brown people, we're all together. I'm not, I'm not against that. What I'm saying, though, 
is for the vast majority of the children that I am talking about, that is not in their immediate future. And since that is not in their immediate future, what do you all suggest that we do while you are pursuing these noble goals of bringing all of these people into the public square? What I'm saying is that, and, and John, this, and let me get, there's actually research out there about what happens in private schools and public schools when it comes to civic discourse and who learns about America and all of this stuff. There's a lot of studies out there that are counterintuitive in terms of where people get the most knowledge about our society from a civic standpoint. The point I'm going to try to make, and I'll, I'll end this, is that the civics lesson that my kids get every single day is that I got to try to figure out how to survive. And the kids in my school should get a medal, many of them, for just showing up at school, given what they're dealing with every single day of their lives. And when they come to us, the last thing they need to hear about is integration. They need to hear about their excellence. They need to hear about their capacity for greatness. They need someone to hug them and tell them that they are great people and they can do great things in spite of all of the obstacles that they will be dealing with probably for the rest of their lives. I don't disagree with that at all. I don't disagree with that at all. I, I just want to underscore, though, you know, housing policy is also school integration policy, and it should not be divorced from that. If we let the society that created concentrated black poverty off the hook and don't push for the furthering affordable fair, say it for me, I've always said the, 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 the HUD rule, Affirmatively, Affirmatively furthering, furthering fair, I always trip on it. If we don't push for that, if we don't pursue policies like Secretary King did, took the Obama administration a while, but they finally started getting with the integration program, at least incentivizing it. You know, there are about 20 to 30 percent of all U.S. census tracts are racially integrated, more than 400 counties do have inclusionary zone ordinances. If you don't have a discourse that talks about the benefits of it, brings allies together, you know, we're basically just going to get more of the same. And what I should, what I say is, I, I'm totally sympathetic. I don't think these are mutually exclusive. You need a robust multiracial coalition that can get to 51% in any policy forum, whether it's the city council or the state legislature, that wins elections for sanity and common sense. But if you're not building that coalition, you're not going to get the kind of equity investments you need for the racially identifiable neighborhoods and schools that do exist. I agree that they exist. A lot of them are going to continue to exist. So, you know. I don't think these are mutually exclusive, but I, I'm just not ready to give up on our ideals. But, but, I, you know. I, but I, I'm not giving up. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and what I'm saying is I, I like all those words, you know, inclusion, diversity, and all that. But I don't see a whole lot of inclusion and diversity and no power. And so, like, one of the things that I will con continue to argue for out here in this whole milieu is all these multiracial coalitions are fine, and I'm all with it. But at some point in time, I want to make sure that black and brown people inside those coalitions have power and that they also have the ability to impact positively what needs to happen in their communities to their children. Because a lot, when black people came out of slavery, we came out of slavery with the clear understanding that we were liberated, but we were not free. And we bought into the notion that in order to actually be free, we needed an education. Poor white people bought into the white supremacist notion that y'all don't need an education because we're going to take care of you. And that no matter how bad things are, you're going to be better than those black people. And so when black people came out saying we need an education, two groups of white people descended on us, missionaries and industrialists. And both of them had different views about what we needed. And what I would argue today is I hear those same arguments over and over again from the latter-day missionaries and the latter-day uh, industrialists telling us what we need and this is what has to happen. And I want to say one last thing. If you read Michelle Foster's book, Black Teachers on Teaching, 
And you, you alluded to it, John. What happened when integration came? Three things happened. Black schools were closed, black teachers lost their jobs, and black teachers' opinions were devalued. What has happened with ed reform? Black schools have been closed, black teachers have lost their jobs, and black teachers' opinions have been devalued. So no matter what strategy you come up with in America, if black people are not diligent, even things that were supposed to be for us will be turned on its head and used against us. That's the America that I know. So let me ask, we're running out of time, so two more questions I want to make sure we get to. To build on that point, how would you respond to folks who say arguments for black empowerment have been appropriated by folks who want to create for-profit charters or for-profit right. vouchers. And so they're using those arguments as a mask for exploitation, not really for liberation. I would argue that there are people who actually do that. And that any conscious black or brown person who don't understand that is a fool. And so therefore, since you already know that, <laughs> then you have to be diligent and you have to be relentless. Because I see myself as a free black man. And as a free black man, I have an independent mind and an independent thought. And throughout my life, both Democrats and Republicans have rubbed me on my head and called me boy. So that in my way of looking at the world, ain't none of them people that I'm going to just automatically trust. And when I see them using things against what I'm supporting, I'm going to call it out. But when you, when you function in a world, John, of, 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 of uh, interest convergence, you're always dealing with people whose worldview you don't share. And the question is, when those interests converge, you take advantage of it, but you're always clear, because you're not going to be bamboozled, that that's going to be there forever, because you come at that convergence with different worldviews. And so if, if you want to get into a long discussion about that, we can get into that. Before we turn to the, to the closing arguments, I want to ask one question that one of the audience members asked about. Ron Brown Academy here in DC. Mm -hmm. and this is a school created for really with a mission of serving African American male students because of the challenges that are so evident in our society and in this city around outcomes for African American males. How do you see an effort like that? How do you reconcile that with the things we've talked about? Or would you not allow such a thing? I'll start with you. I would allow it, I, I'd allow anything that gives people more choices decoupled from where they live. Uh, you know, I'm all for choice, and if that, if that works, you know, I mean, I may end up sending both my kids to Morehouse, right? You know, I, I, I'm for choices, right? And um, I hope that that school has the resources it needs to meet its mission, and I, I'm, you know, so I, I don't, I mean, I'm not, um, again, let me, let me clarify, but my position is the federal, state, and many local governments are complicit, are complicit in locking people out, othering people, creating concentrated, segregated neighborhoods and schools. They're complicit in that. Right? And they have an obligation to pursue different public policies to undo, dismantle, confront segregation. That is my main point. Um, and, I, and if they don't do that, we're just it, concentrated black poverty is a modern manifestation of the ideology of white supremacy that we still live with. And if you haven't noticed, the, particularly the, the, a lot of the discourse around blaming people who live in those circumstances, for, you know, as if they're somehow complicit, it, it, it's, it's part of the discourse that continues this ideology, continues to bring people um, into this idea that I deserve to be a separate and apart. So um, that's my main message that government has no business encouraging or acquiescing in the segregation it helped to create and perpetuate. 
Let me ask one last question of you, Professor Phil, and then we'll turn to closing arguments. Uh, and it was a question asked by one of the audience members. You talked about the, in the, the role of white folks as industrialists versus missionaries. What is the right role for the white educator in our current circumstance? I think the role of the white educator is, first of all, to be whoever it is you are. You know, don't be trying to roll up in there, you know, trying to save us. Uh, but if you have skills that we need, anybody with any sense would welcome you. I mean, if you come to our school, the vast majority of our teachers are white. The issue to me is not that they're white. The issue is, are you really a great teacher? And if you are a great teacher, you actually are going to have a great respect and love for the kids in our school. And, and so what, what, what I'm saying to anybody of any race is that I welcome you to, 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 to come into our community, into our schools. But what I don't want you to do is to come in there with the idea that, that you are the only one who knows what is best for us. And I need to have people who are willing to listen, to be respectful, and to understand that we not only have a point of view, but that we have a knowledge base. And that don't come into us with a deficit approach to what it is that we bring to the table, but come to us understanding the assets that we bring to the table that will be critical for our own ability to fight for our own freedom. And, and so again, John, I just want to end by, by, by saying all of what Cheryl just said at the end, I don't, there's nothing she said <laughs> that I disagree with, actually. I mean, I, I, I agree with that. And, 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 I've try, and I've tried to argue that, that these strategies should not be mutually exclusive. It's a question, I guess, of where you're going to place focus at a certain moment in time. So we, we are approaching the end. Final yeah. comments? Yeah, my, my final thing is that in 1935, W.E.B. Du Bois, is, you know, uh, in the Journal of Negro Education, was talking, they, they were debating the question of education for black people. And what he said is that the Negro needs neither segregated schools nor mixed schools. What he, and I added the she, what he or she needs is education. What he or she must remember is there is no magic either in mixed schools or in segregated schools. A mixed school with poor and unsympathetic teachers with hostile public opinion, and no teaching of truth concerning black folk is bad. A segregated school with ignorant placeholders, inadequate equipment, poor salaries, wretched housing is equally bad. Other things being equal, the mixed school is the broader, more natural basis for the education of youth. It gives wider contacts, it inspires greater self-confidence, and suppresses the inferiority complex. But other things seldom but all things are seldom equal. And in that case, sympathy, knowledge, and the truth outweigh all that mixed schools can offer. And the final point I would make is, it is a hoax that has been perpetrated on America that we're somehow going to integrate America by integrating schools. And we don't have to deal with any of these other public policies, housing, economic, the, the prison, all, all of these things, but somehow, we're going to integrate America by integrating schools. That is a hoax. It's bogus. It's a lie. And that if we're serious about, quote, integrating schools, then we have to be equally serious about changing all of these policies that actually do what Cheryl said they do, which is confine people to a powerless situation. Professor Cashin, closing words. I agree with that point. <laughs> I'd like you to consider a thought experiment. Consider how different our nation would be if we did not have concentrated poverty neighborhoods and concentrated poverty schools. Perhaps you can imagine the wider range of choices people of all classes and races might have for schools and neighborhoods. Policies and preferences of avoidance might be less common and individuals and institutions less risk averse, more willing to try to enter or invite robust, robust diversity. Above all, poor black and brown people might be seen as three-dimensional human beings worthy of the title citizen. Given the enduring 
effectiveness of divide and conquer, dog whistling politics. I have little hope of a class consciousness arising to unify struggling people of all colors. I am, however, optimistic about the possibilities for creating ascending coalitions of culturally dexterous whites and progressive people of color that can fight together for both integration and equity in the regions where they live. Um, things change. California, 20 years ago, was pursuing the same kind of mean-spirited, anti-immigrant, three strikes and you're out policies that you know, we're seeing coming out of the White House. And now, California, because of a, a coalition of the ascendant, is retreating from the war on drugs, investing more in education, leading on climate change. It's a very different state. We have to imagine the country we want before we can usher it in and get up every day and fight for it. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So now we vote again. So remember, you're going, the, the question uh, before us is the, the notion that one of the biggest threats to education today is school segregation. Text yes, no, or undecided to 37607. It's like the political, it's like, it's, it's like November 2016. <laughs> she thought she was winning, but then she wasn't. She lost Michigan. <laughs> I can't look, I can't look. Hey, this wow. is just like the election. Wow. Yay. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> no collusion. Well, I, no I, sus collusion. I, sus I suspect the margin here is narrow enough. The longer we stand here, the more it will go back and forth. So let me, let me just ask us to again thank our fabulous debaters. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again to the Century Foundation and NYU for hosting us, and thank you all for joining us. Thanks so much.